on Anderson's TV and in a fantastic, uh, you know, well, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, I'm just in a good mood because <laughs> this fine gentleman here, Mr. Martin Harley, when we were slightly bigger than nippers, but you know, yeah. cutting our teeth in the guitar world, I was working in Anderson's and Martin used to come in all the time with his dad. Yep, very um, true. Living proof that you can still get the blues in the leafy suburbs of Woking. <laughs> Um, the famous breeding yeah. ground for blues men yeah, and, on, the, um, on the Delta, Woking Delta. Back then, you were sort of, you know, starting on a journey and getting a, you know, getting a little bit of a profile as a, a sort of a rootsy, bluesy kind of guitar player. Yeah. And it, I hadn't seen you for years and years and years, and then saw you at a festival like a month ago. In the rainy mud of, <laughs> yeah. of, of Wayfest. <laughs> So fill me in, man, on like, you know. <laughs> on the last 22 years. Pretty much. Well, clearly in our pre the preamble to this, both Lee and I are becoming tensely grumpy old men. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's 20, 22 years of grump. No, um, so yeah, I was living in this area. I, I think the reason I stopped being here for a while, I went to live in Australia, um, just the lust for travel took me there. I took an acoustic guitar. The guitar I took was living in the back of this hot car. I was, you know, I was really rambling on the cheap. The neck bent up and the action got really high, so I started tuning into an open chord, started messing around with slide. It was, that was about the same time that I heard artists oh, like Kelly Joe Phelps. And so there was a little bit of a reinvention of myself, I think. And also there was a lot of life experiences being had, a lot of, you know, a bit of heartbreak, loss, despair. And um, when I came back from that particular year of, of adventures, I felt like I wanted to make a record as a diary of just the things that I'd, I'd done. So I did, um, and Angus Cowan, in fact, engineered this um, at my old house oh, down man. the road. We made so a many names from, <laughs> from your past. From the past. past. <laughs> and essentially made a really cheap record, took it on the road, started selling out the boot of the car, and to my su ultimate surprise, people bought it, people liked it. That was the time where you had to buy CDs if you wanted <laughs> someone's music. So I was like, hey, Maybe I can do this. And uh, it just naturally progressed. You know, play on the street, get picked up playing on the street to go and play in a bar because whoever had a bar is thinking, there's 100 people watching this guy. They could be in my venue and they, I could be making the beer money. And we, you know, um, we took, took advantage of that and uh, bust down in Cornwall, got a bit of a reputation there. Just kept traveling, kept playing, kept doing it. Last three records have been Texas, or well, four records now have been Texas, Nashville, Nashville. I've just made a new one called Roll the Punches. It's coming out November 1st. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's all brings us up to here. I'm, I'm, I'm on nine records. I've been playing a lot of roots and bluesy stuff. I've learned a lot going to America. I think America is always, you know, us maybe growing up here, you always looked at what was going on in the guitar world and yeah. guitar manufacturers and just it always seemed like the cool stuff at that period was coming out of America. So that always had a strong draw for me and I've learned a lot. Um, from American players and uh, especially songwriters in Nashville. How to do less and just to improve the the skill of the song. That's for sure. Well, that's, so how did, what was the, the sort of, the transition for you? Because I'm trying to, you know, I, I remember, you know, you coming into the store loads, the dad coming in, you know, we always got on, but I, I don't, I don't know that you were necessarily singing at that point. Or no. at least. So where, where, where did that sort of, transition into sort of starting again because what was the first album the one you did in Australia was that entirely instrumental or is that no a bit of that, that's when I started singing so previous to making that record yes I had been a guitar player in kind of more sort of classic rock mm -hmm. and then sort of stoner rock I always loved those bands like Caius really big low down yeah. tune filthy like big riffs so almost like blues riffs but yeah you know slowed down and, and Black Sabbath Masters of Reality, they really captured my imagination. So, and guitar was my primary focus at that time. And I think the singer just left the band I was in and they were like, come on, 
right get on with it and and it was terrible for a while i'm a (laughs) self-conscious singer i would still say my voice is my weak point not fishing for compliments i know it's decent enough but it's not i'm not comfortable with my voice as say my guitar player so they're still still getting that balance right and so i I, again i i know when i saw you at the at the festival i had the opposite you know not as in i I look i watched you and i thought this guy is confident he's got his stage show together there's banter with the audience the songs are good it was like it it didn't come across to me like here's here's someone that you know plays the guitar and is a bit shy about singing you know oh i mean i've had 22 years to learn how to hide that part but (laughs) if i'm being totally honest you know when i perceive what i'm doing and i look for the room for improvement to develop because music is Hopefully, this this never ending learning curve, which is why it's such a wonderful profession. I think you're like you're always learning, even with guitar, learning to play less, learning to yeah. be more tasteful, learning to take care of you know the tone, learning you know just the usefulness of the volume knob. Whereas when I was a kid, just like, ah! what did you what did you didn't you buy a really nice Les Paul? Didn't we didn't we spend weeks and it. months trying to? You still got still, it? Yes, a 1960 classic Les Paul. That's and it. What I bought from I also bought from you was a PV Classic 30, which literally Great, looks like. like someone has put it in the middle of the Arizona desert and and blown it up with a massive missile launcher. I mean, it's I don't think there's an amplifier that looks as beaten up in the world. Um, but yeah, that's 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 been retired then oh <laughs> I, yeah uh, and it, so i mean i'm fascinated how you've sort of transitioned from playing you know sort of regular uh stand up kind of normal tuning guitar mm-hmm. to um you seem exactly. most comfortable with you know slides sitting down on your lap. yeah what, where, i know you mentioned the australia thing but let's, what, can what? we can we sort of embellish on that a bit yeah there? well what's nice about the open tune in here is uh, this is not um, like pedal steel. Pedal steel is more strings, knees, levers, more of a country sound. Although I do try and emulate one by sort of bending behind the strings. Um, but what we have here is a, it's like a regular electric guitar, but it's got a square neck. You can't yeah. push your fingers down onto the fret. It's tuned to an open D. When I'm playing bottleneck, it's tuned to an open E on this one. And the style that I'm carrying on with is, is like, it's really picked up from that acoustic thing where when I've been playing solo, I'm trying to emulate a bass player yeah. at this end. So I've got my two Ds, you've got a D, A, D, F sharp, A, D, and your open D. So I'm trying to keep that going and then isolate single notes to give me a platform to sing over. Right. So it's quite a complete sound. It's also like Travis, you know, Travis picking um, on an acoustic, but you're doing it lap style. And I think, as well as it being a great compliment to a voice and being able to do shows on my own, which is first because. You need to make money as a musician. Yeah. Sometimes to have a band, you need to afford a band. So there's always a mixture of solo, duo, and band work for me. Um, I love playing alone. It means I can improvise. Um, and the slide guitar's got a very vocal quality. Mm. You know, uh, you hear David, D- uh, David, David Trucks, the brother of <laughs> the great other slide guitar yes. player, <laughs> Derek Trucks. Um, you hear him talking about that a lot, that it very much has a voice, it has a vibrato, you know, in the same way as you can tell B.B. King's vibrato, which, I, which was, I think, based on Buck or White's slide plan anyway. That quite quick thing. Mm. You know, Ariel and... Um, uh, Ariel Possum and, and Joey Landry, they're cr- brilliant at that uh, that vocal slide playing as well, yeah. that bottleneck thing and the swells and all those sounds that come from the gospel side of slide playing, the, sac- the sacred steel. <laughs> that kind of imitation of the gospel singers. Um, so yeah, that vocal quality mixed with the fact that you can play shows on your own, especially in the acoustic version. Um, it's just really kept me attached to that that instrument. It keeps me excited. I never feel like I'm running out of, of things to do or things to learn. So, what's the what's the audience um, 
not so much the reaction, but just like the, 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 the appetite for this kind of music over here versus when you're in the States. Is it, is it easier to get gigs for your style of music in the States or not really? Re it's region by region. It, it's hard to know exactly what resonates where and why. And if I knew, I'd probably be much wealthier than I am. <laughs> I made a very simple record at Southern Ground with a friend, Daniel Kimbrough. Made it in four hours and just played some songs I've been playing live for a few years put up some nice mics, a couple of takes of each song, put it out. Gave that to a Canadian booking agent and I got nearly every major festival in Canada that summer. It was amazing, an amazing reaction. I spent a lot of more time and a lot more money making a much more complicated and, and more produced album with a much bigger budget for its release and it hasn't done anything like as well. So I don't know exactly what resonates, but I would say that America's been good I felt like taking roots Americana based music. Mm. So I know that's a bit of, that's a key word at the moment, but you know, it's songwriting. There's aspects of gospel and rhythm and blues and rock and roll, all that kind of muddled into one. All those influences are in there. I thought it would be like taking sand to the beach, but there is, there is definitely an interest in it. And a lot of the more surprising comments are like, what would you call the music you're playing, and I might be playing something like a Blind Willie Johnson song, which is very much American mm -hmm. folk music from the Mississippi Delta in the sort of, in the mid thirties. You know, that Delta style of playing, there's a, you know, with your Robert Johnson and your Blind Willie Johnson, and Lemon Jefferson, and very capable players making that very complete sound, like I was saying, this one man band mm -hmm. thing. Um, and a lot of people in America will be like, what do you call that? And I'm like, <laughs> like Americans, uh, American roots music. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, I, there's a good market f for it here. I, I think there's there's an emerging market. I think country is, is doing quite well at the moment. It's growing as a brand, and that brings with it elements of bluegrass and elements of acoustic yeah. blues. And the singer-songwriter thing kind of melts into that, and all seemingly under this um, blanket of Americana, because I'm not really straight ahead blues. No. Um, it's, you know, and it's... it's it's interesting you say that there's been a real seed change over here in again the the, the sort of interest in in a much broader country you know I, I think if we go back to probably when we were growing up you, if you said country music not only would an, an English person you just immediately think of Dolly Parton and go I'm not interested at all although she is awesome but well yeah I think you're right now even now we'd probably go yeah I, I, my, my if I could talk to my younger my younger you'd self be like, yeah, just yeah, listen to it a bit more because listen to old country yeah I, I think what I think what we didn't have here is someone to say look man country is not Billy Ray Cyrus okay and it's not <laughs> you know bro country it's not parental bad advice pickup trucks you know, girls in denim shorts, you know, there is an auto-tuned pop version of country which has grown slowly on its own trajectory and I personally find it a bit soulless. But there's all that great sort of Hank Williams stuff, mm -hmm. there's all the Johnny Cash stuff, you know, and, and uh, Dolly Parton as well. Uh, uh, there is so much good old country, but I had to go to America and meet people and, and, and just be re-educated and right. um, letting, letting go of uh, preconceptions about about anything has really helped me move forward as a as a songwriter. Sometimes I, I've ignored a really good song because I, initially I don't like whatever genre it presents itself as initially, and so I switch off to it. And now I go back a few years later. There's a grumpy old bear, <laughs> and uh, and I find myself really able to see the you know the genius of these things. But yeah, you're right. I mean, country was was a weird thing, and then. In the well, mid '80s yeah. through to '90s, and it England, wasn't we cool, exposed. was it? It, it wasn't, wasn't cool. cool. No. And now it feels like it, it kind of it can be, I and mean, it is. Yeah. Um, how do you? I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated with the, the gear because although we're all guitar players, uh, the only one here that really looks like anything <laughs> I could get a note out of would be that one. And even, yeah. even that, I'm not so sure. But so, t take us through your your three weapons of choice. Weapons here. of choice. Well, the the whole. I'm going back to electric after playing acoustic for quite a while now so I'm gonna I'm gonna be hitting the road f for the next two with this so I'm quite new to bottleneck playing mm -hmm. the problem with playing slide like this is you, you're glued to one position it's quite hard you're on a big stage you're trying to get into yeah. it and people are like why is he sitting down um, so this is an attempt at taking some of the sounds that I can get from this you know in a more portable format um, I would it's 
called a Cuda caster, or a lot of people call it a Cuda caster after Ryan Cuda's guitars. And what your primary difference here is, is that this is a string through pickup. Oh, wow. So it's single coil, but it's from a lap steel. It's from a 1950s Supro lap steel. Right. Um, and that's just dropped straight in there. And this is off um, a K guitar. So this, sorry, so this metal piece on the top is an integral part of the pickup? If you take it off, pickup doesn't work. Oh, yeah, wow. Some have magnets on both sides. This has a block of wood here yeah. and a magnet there, and it creates a magnetic field inside. So it has a really unusual sound. Um, I'm using 13 gauge semi flat round strings on this. So the tension's quite high, so I don't get too much of that rattle from the bottleneck slide. Um, this is a cheap imitation, I think, of a gold foil that was in an old K guitar someone gave me, and I thought, um, I'll chuck them in this. It's a parts caster. It was, it was pretty cheap. It actually looks like when I took it apart, the neck's quite a nice neck. So, I'm, you know, there are still bargains to be found on eBay somewhere. But so yeah, we're in a in a more regular electric guitar format. It's tuned to open E chord, yeah. playing it with bottleneck. But the advantage I have here is I can still finger notes. Yeah. Um, whereas this, everything is with the bar. And what what's the, is there a bit? I mean, you 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 just said that you know it's a big difference playing with the the, the lap steel kind of bar. Oh yeah, this thing. versus a bottleneck. I never even assumed that. I just assumed that would be a relatively straightforward transition. So it's heavy. It's pretty heavy, yeah. So what you what you stand to gain from it being heavier is better sustain, um, and I suppose gravity just, is helping, isn't gravity's it? Gravity's helping. Because you're not you're not playing side on, and, and and you're this way around, so you can isolate single notes. If you got the, mm -hmm. if you were playing that with a bottleneck, you, you obviously you yeah. can do it, but it, it's quite awkward. Speaking of uh, our dear friends Joey and Ariel, yeah. have you ever used their? Because they they came up with the sort of the bullet tip yeah. kind of end on the slide. I think specifically to try and enable you to sort of angle the slide and a be a little bit more. Bit more. And yes, you tried one. Of I, those, haven't, I haven't tried it. Yeah, no. Well, I, bumped I into shall, those I shall get you things. one before you before you leave the store. <laughs> you can have a freebie on me. Um, and it's made see the whole day worth. Yeah, it. I knew they'd give me some free stuff. <laughs> um, and just. Uh, See if uh, see if that helps. But okay, so to jump it back over to, yeah. does it? I plug it in. Yeah. So when when you go, does it force you to play very differently, or are you just transferring? I know, I know you mentioned the it individual does. notes. It does. I mean, that's yeah. one of the nice things. Shall I, shall I hold that? It yeah, looks a bit then. precarious on on there. It's had a, don't it, worry, everyone. I'm not going to try and play it. <laughs> it's had a hard life and it already. Maybe I will. Go for it. And it's tuned to a D, is it? Yeah. What does that even mean? With, you've just got an open major chord, as if you were holding an E chord, but a tuned down, a, a toned down. That's the most boring piece of video you're going to see all day. It's me, <laughs> it's me literally just going, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, it's, it, you know. It's quite a lot heavier than I thought it would be. It must be, it's just like, it is a gigantic piece of two before, isn't it, the neck? Yeah, it's got a lot of sustain, <laughs> and that's, that, that's what you want. Martin's signature from 2010. That's it. It looks older. It's it like, does. It's obviously, it's obviously been properly gigged, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just come back from the shop, actually, because it's just a few bits were wearing out. It's been played that much. Really interesting. Um, the acoustic sort of tailpiece, but electric pickups. Yeah, I think they it's a bow tie tailpiece, which is um, traditional to Hawaiian style guitars, which okay. I guess we'll get onto that with the wires and born in a minute. But I've, I've always liked that kind of, that, that look. And it's built to the same specifics um, dimension-wise as that. So same scale length, same string spacing. And so I don't, so I don't go the, from playing that to playing that and, and, and fluff notes because the... Someone's the put the machine heads on the wrong way around on this one now. I don't know if you ever noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you do it while I was, yeah. while I was drinking coffee? Really? Wah! Come on then, give us a... So, so, so what, what do we do here? So here we've got the slide note. But I can make many more different chords. I mean, you can tune the, that to a C6 and you can get to a lot of places, but if it's the only instrument you've got to hand, what I like about this is you have the best of, hopefully, both worlds. Get a nice little 
minors by by having your having the yep. slide cover and all the strings and if you're just gentle enough you can go the string behind where your major is and so you've got your major there so it's just a few little tricks to give you more chords to play with it um, sounds it sounds thinner it doesn't i think i could sort of sit in a band scenario i suppose yeah. you won't notice that but if you've got to be on your own there's something very fat about this yeah, that's what i mean the size of the strings and um, the pickups are made for us where they're really fat sounding right. Um, yeah, just it's really su super solid body. It's all part the same part of mm -hmm. one word, you know. And this is, yeah, it's, it's never going to sustain as well mm -hmm. or, or sound quite fat. I mean, if you actually put up against the regular strat, it sounds pretty fat next to yeah. one of those. Um, and it's, it's very hard to find regular guitars that sort of compete with the slide animals because for an acoustic instrument as well, that's super loud. Mm -hmm. So if you pick up a D18 afterwards, you're like, it sounds tiny, but I know it sounds big. Um. <laughs> it's just weird, and I, I get, I, re I get exactly what you're saying. What I think one of the reasons why I've never been really into seeing a band where the front person's a keyboard player, I think, is largely because it just gets a bit boring just watching somebody just sit down. You know, I, I could, if I think, if I was coming to see you and you were playing this, and it was a fairly small club and it was intimate and you know you get you have good bands with your audiences so i think it's kind of works but you know the bigger the venue gets yeah the more it becomes quite obvious that you're just going you haven't moved the entire set yeah, yeah <laughs> it's like, you know well that's it see i do a lot of what i call soft seated gigs or theater gigs where i'm gonna have a couple of beers i'm gonna talk about where the songs came from i'm gonna talk about the guitars i'm gonna ask people questions yeah. it's gonna be this interaction you know and up to a couple of hundred people that's great. And if people are close, they can see what you're doing with your fingers and the instruments are interesting. I use that and a resonator for a lot of the time for solo shows. And just, it's intimate. People aren't standing. There's not gonna be a bunch of noise coming from the bar. So you can take them on a journey. That's one thing. But I was finding as the stages get, get bigger and we're playing more festivals with this new sort of band project that just being there and being static, just, yeah. it, it just doesn't feel as engaged. You know, I wanna be able to, you know, to turn around and sort of engage with the bass player a little bit and also just look around, just navigate. I, you know, I feel quite awkward standing up. I'm so used to sitting down. Um, but it's a fun transition. Like all of these things, like I was saying, it's a, a constant learning curve. The, the sort of standing up and playing and trying to engage in a different way is a, is a new beast to me. And um, I like it. I, you know, I, the fear of failure is, is okay. Oh, well, you're, you're a very modest chap, I must admit, I, I, if, you know, I, I must remind the pe uh, people who are watching here, you know, M Martin is a pretty successful musician now, having played some pretty outrageously big gigs, so the fact that you're so humble and happy to sit and talk about this journey still is, is very cool. Let's, um, I mean, this is a work of art, isn't it? It's amazing. It's like some sort of koa, is it koa? Yeah. Book match, oh, flame color. It's a, I met Andreas, Andreas Kuntz. Yes. And uh, he is, he's just a monster in terms of attention to detail. Just his craftsmanship is just way, way out there. Um, so this is similar to an instrument affectionately known as the, as the Weizenborn, um, which is a traditional kind of Hawaiian guitar. Mm -hmm. So a guy called Herman Weizenborn um, and John Knutson were guitar builders um, in, around California in the 1920s. They'd been to Hawaii and seen how people were playing with these traditional shaped guitars. And slide guitar and lap steel, huge, 20s, 30s especially. Mm -hmm. Like there were whole schools dedicated to lap slide playing in, in Vancouver and elsewhere. So it was a really big craze. And they were making student models and made them one through four. And this is a representation of that. There's a few minor changes in that the headstock is more traditional. I like the slotted headstock design. That's why I wanted original Weizenborn sort of tail off um, with the tuning pegs coming out the side. I own some old ones and they're, they're wonderful instruments, but they are coming up for 100 years old. So if you take them on the road, it's, you know, it's gonna go wrong. And um, so he's built this to be a really good sounding, functioning, um, working, working guitar. If you give me that slide back, yeah, I'll... Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's, it's this, but in its acoustic form.
cool thing. I love the fact that you know that that you know here's another thing that a guitar player could get into. It's just you know it's just not you know if you if you've got your normal six string electric guitar and you're just thinking ah oh, you know it's like what else? It's like yeah, it's yeah. just this is so cool and it's not you know I know I I, I think. Maybe, maybe we'll find out over the next few weeks. I think I could sit here and with a few hours just kind of start to get a bit of a tune it's not out a giant of it, you know. Leap. It's not a giant leap. Um, you know, if it, if you can hold down that sort of alternate bass line thing, yeah. you know, this is, this is always where I'd say the, the beginning of my style starts. To, if you can keep that going like your Travis picking, like anything else, and slowly take the, the high D in this case, uh, but your thinnest string and just start playing a single note melody. It's just once you get past that the mechanics of that, then everything That's opens wicked. up a little bit more. And I, I think I don't think it's a giant leap for no. a guitarist, which is what, what you're saying. Um, I think the only thing that Anderson sells that would be remotely like this. I think there's an Epiphone Dobro with a square neck. In fact, I say I think so. I know there is an Epiphone, yeah. and it, and I, but I don't. I wouldn't even know where to start in terms of other mainstream manufacturers that are making these kind of guitars. Well, I mean, but, you know, not to stop anyone spending money anywhere, but it's a great thing to do with a guitar that's got a warped neck. Or you can take <laughs> shout. A, yeah, you can take a. Um, I mean, I, I found old twelve strings I've owned, so you could, mm. you could maybe get a sixties or a seventies Gibson, you know, dreadnought. There's a twelve string that's completely that's, ruined. It's knackered, but it's still a great guitar. It's never going to be playable unless you go right the way through a neck reset and maybe it's twisted, whatever. But then you've got a great body of guitar, great sound, but and is know, it just can, a, can a tech yeah just put a bigger nut on yeah. and boom. knock out the old nut. You can you can get um, little metal um, additional. Uh, it's like, it's a, like a, a U something. shape goes right. over the oh, top okay. that has pre-cut uh, slots. So you can yeah you can essentially take your strap, throw one of those over the top, jack your action up there a little bit. I mean, it's a style you don't have to go all in. You know you don't have to throw all the money yeah, at it yeah, and yeah. buy all the gear. There's plenty of ways of trying trying the style before before you go shopping. But there are a lot of good little resonators, Dobros, they're, you know, fairly inexpensive. Um, you know, you don't have to go crazy to start getting good sounds. And, and other than uh, your back catalogue of music, which of course you will find a link to in the description below this video, um, who else, you know, if people are going, oh, I like that, you know, who, who else should they be trying who's to listen good? to? Well, yeah, who's I mean, good? Who's good? I mean, there's <laughs> a lot- Or who do you personally like? There's a lot of great people. Um, well, Joey Landris playing is really good. It's really vocal. It's really nice. Derek Trucks is really good. That's more sort of the electric mm -hmm. side of things. Um, for me, like the singer and, and the instrument is really key. If there's someone who can do both things really well, that's when I start to get really interested. And there's a guy called Kelly Joe Phelps who stopped me in my tracks. Right. I saw him at the London Union Chapel. Okay. Um, and I was a bit late for the show, ran in, and uh, it, it, it's a... It's a chapel, so it was a weird, almost religious experience. It's this one guy playing slide like this. Everyone's pin drop quiet, and he's got them, right. you know, and he got me, and I was like, holy smoke, what's going on? Um, so he's really worth checking out. You'll see a lot of elements of my style are, are very much Kelly Joe Phelps elements. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm all over the place. I was likely to be listening to Nick Lowe as I am, JJ Kale or Nina Simone. I was like, if if it gets you and moves you, then 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 I'm I'm all about that. It doesn't really matter the genre too specifically. I'm personally drawn to less pretentious, or what I would describe as less pretentious music, like heartfelt music. Someone who's clearly using music as a tool to express themselves in a way they feel they need to express themselves. Um, and, and that's what I'm drawn to, you know? Um, so, well, you, you can always go your John Martins, your Nick Drakes, those great finger pickers yeah. as well. You know, they were all drawing from blues aspects and folk aspects. Um, so, and where could the fine people of YouTube uh, see you perhaps at a show 
this year? Are you predominantly UK or are you going stateside again? I'm all over the shop. I'm doing a full UK tour from the 1st to the 19th of October. Oh. Um, the closest one to you here would probably be the Union Chapel in Islington, which is the reason I wanted to play this because I saw Kelly J. Phelps there and it was such a career changing um, path for me. Uh, but I'm everywhere. I'm down in Portsmouth too. But if people go to martinharley.com and just find it, martinharley.com down here. I've never done that before. Yeah, it's exactly. It's, it's great. It's great, here. isn't it? You have here. the power. You can do anything. You could say it's over here. It could, it could even be here. It's, it's totally where, here. wherever you want it to be. But yeah, well, I'm on tour with the band. So it's very much band record. Just made it out in the wilds of Pembrokeshire. Oh. I've made some records overseas for the last three times. They were great, but I wanted to be back in England, be a bit closer to family, to be able to to and fro from the studio a little bit. But we were out in the middle of nowhere in this, in uh, Studio Z, in uh, Studios in, uh, in Pembrokeshire, and it is in the middle of nowhere, super peaceful, old converted chapel. I don't know what it is with me and religious uh, wow. uh, buildings, but um, yeah, it's very much an analog, sort of dirty, sly guitar sort of, sort of thing. Well, let's hope, I think, really martin should play us out with a song of his choice and we'll grab your microphone but let's hope can you imagine if we allow another 22 years to pass before we see each other again we should be so bald and grumpy we're gonna be so grumpy Lee. <laughs> so grumpy but let's put that date in the diary now for, it's a deal uh, for september if we make it 2041 or whatever it will yeah. be um yeah absolutely if we're still here yeah we, oh my goodness me oh, we like all the heart monitoring machines I do like i'm like still that. here of course me too we will we will <laughs> anyway look uh this is martin harley it's it's such a great to, to see you again and uh good luck with with everything else you're doing uh go check out this man's music it's great and uh this is it mr martin harley thanks very much folks Hi, well, this song is called Brother, and um, it's become apparent to me over the last few years how bad men are at talking to each other about everything. Obviously not me and Lee, because we haven't seen each other for so long. But um, I think this song was inspired by friends going through hard times, but also knowing a lot more men in the 40 to 50 bracket. And I think uh, sometimes it's easy to shut down and not talk about what's going on. And uh, I, this song is an invitation to... Uh, to talk, and uh, it's called Brother. If the load gets heavy and hard to stand, brother, call on me. To lend a hand, brother, call on me. And if the waves are towering over your boat, brother, call on me. I'll be there to throw the rope, brother, call on me. Call on me. Call on me Call on me Brother, you can call on me If you've been down so low That it feels like a Brother, call on me I'll fill that wine to the top of your cup Brother, call on me Call on me Call on me Call on me Brother, you can call on me times of trouble, in times of need, don't be a stranger, brother you can call on me, call on me, call on me, call on me, brother you 
can call on me In times of trouble In times of need Don't be a stranger Brother, you can call Brother, you can call on me